Hari di atena nohani na tabi diz tait ana wat nusu diz skak sot ni ne bez delit la no yes tai sot ni ez delit no hani no no zi sot chos tai ni ez delit sa tu kat zan in zan et no ni no le a de ni di zana wat no health sot tak ni ez delit chat hot zana aten zel chat. Nobody knows our culture. Nobody knows our history or our languages better than we do. And those are things that we can incorporate into the way that services will be delivered to the people. At Gathering Wisdom 4 in Richmond this year, Chiefs made a decision to proceed with taking the opportunity offered by Health Canada to transfer the Pacific region from government control to First Nations control. We left Richmond united and ready to proceed with this opportunity. We're taking over an institution. That institution is designed to meet other needs. Over coming weeks, years, months, we'll have an opportunity to redesign, renovate, tear down those parts of that institution that aren't working, and strengthen and improve that institution so it delivers better services. When you're thinking about transition, if you think about your own home, you can't buy a house and renovate it at the same time. In our case, we have to have the transition period. We have to transition from the existing Health Canada system to our own interim First Nations Health Authority before we can renovate it into our First Nations Health Authority for the province of British Columbia. If you liken it to going through school, you transition from kindergarten to grade one. You transition from the next grade to the next grade. It's only upon graduation where you see transformation. Now you're becoming a whole human. What am I? What is my potential? What is my capacity? What can I become? Up until then, you told what you need to be. So transition is about moving forward. Transformation is about change, but not changing until we know what we're supposed to do. We have two years to complete the transfer. In two years' time, we will have complete control of all of those programs that are currently delivered by Health Canada. It will take us some time to learn and understand how those programs are being delivered. And that will require a discussion and a conclusion of sub-agreements that will set out how we transfer all the staff, how we transfer all the information management, information technology, how we transfer records, how we transfer those kind of um, tangible things around how Finney operates. So transformation will take place in a greater way after we transfer and transition all these pieces into the new First Nations Health Authority because in the interim, all those programs and services currently still run through federal policy. Once they're transferred over, they'll no longer run under those same federal policies. They'll start running under our own direction and control. 25 years in the health transfer process has taught us that the only way that we are actually going to create the kinds of changes that we need is if we take over the whole system. I think it's taught us that government programs designed in Ottawa don't necessarily work for us, so giving First Nations people control is the right thing to do. What we've learned from talking to other Indigenous people who have taken down their own health is that it's a lot of hard work, but a lot of discipline is is required to ensure that you get to where you want to be. As Indigenous people, we've been under the cloak of colonization for several years, and we have much to learn from each other. So basic dialogue, networking will provide us that avenue to ensure that we don't duplicate mistakes. When we went to see how the tribes in Alaska work together, there was wisdom in how they organized themselves and how they organized the delivery of those services. For some services, economies of scale, issues around funding, required communities to collaborate, to come together. And so partnerships of 50, 60 communities came together and said, we're gonna create a center for this service. While First Nations in British Columbia suffer the same types of health disparities, there are differences based on our geography and our environment in different parts of BC. For example, in Northern British Columbia, we have a vast geography. What happens now is you send out 100 community members to a larger urban center to access the services of a physician. That's an expensive proposition, especially when our communities are impoverished and have a difficult time with transportation. Why wouldn't we look at paying one physician 
to go into that rural and remote community once or twice a week or whatever is required to meet that particular need and pay one person to travel as opposed to paying uh, the patients to travel to see the physician. So I think there are cost-effective ways of making sure that we provide the quality of care that our citizens deserve, but spend our money much wiser than we do today. The difference between governance and government is that the governance piece of that is around the decision-making, the political level decision-making and strategic political direction that's been provided in relation to this situation around the kinds of health services and the relationships that are needed to improve the health outcomes of First Nations people. The government side of it, I think, relates more to the operational side of actually delivering those programs and services. So if we likened governance and government to a human body, governance would be the thinking, the visionary, the head that's hearing, thinking, talking, all of those things, while government would be the arms and the legs, the ones that are doing the actual work, carrying out the work to achieve the vision of governance. It is important to separate business from politics. In fact, we have commitments in our framework agreement that ensure that we need to do that. We have to have a process that's going to be as apolitical as possible, that processes are in place to ensure transparency, accountability, and integrity. I think it's fair to say that when we separate politics from business, that makes our job that much more easier. It provides with accountability and it provides with outputs and measurable results. Governance is, we would call it politics in other words, because that's setting policy, where government is running the business. So you really want to have a separation because if you don't, you're going to have the people that should be following the rules setting the rules and changing the rules, which is really the job of governance. So separating politics, the policy making is critical in that they have got to be the ones again to envision, to, to bring the standards into consideration and to ensure that the, the house, the frame for the house is set in such a way that it protects the occupants. The people that are doing the work the people that are, are, are uh, doing the business, as we say, they've got to live in that house and be comfortable but they shouldn't be you know, changing the roof or redesigning it. That's the work of governance. So politicians have to set the tone and we have to be able to separate that so there's no interference between the two entities as we move forward. We absolutely cannot do this alone. We need partnerships. Not only partnerships with government and with health authorities, but partnerships with each other. And that's the importance of the work that we're doing, the opportunity to come together, work together, and develop strong partnerships. In British Columbia, the primary provider of health services is the province, and they run all of the acute care system in British Columbia. And our people interface with that system. We depend on that system and for acute care services. So it's not something that we're going to be delivering on our own through this arrangement that we have with Health Canada. The, discussions that we have to have with the province is to try and ensure that those services and those resources that are available for First Nations people or that are required by First Nations people are accessible and are providing the kind of services that provide the benefit to the First Nations people uh, from a culturally competent and culturally safe perspective. There are other players on the ground within each of our regions that could be and should be um, part of this process of change. We have various programs and services that are designed as part of the social safety net of the province. And um, we're actually starting to think they're more like a hammock than a social safety net, being things like social assistance, et cetera. And we see that there's an opportunity to better use those resources to actually achieve health outcomes. We need to ensure that the First Nations within each region of British Columbia, where there's a regional health authority, has the ability to partner and leverage through a political governance relationship the kind of services from the provincial system that they need to improve the quality of care to First Nations people within that area. Partnerships are also necessary at the community level because we know, again, we have limited resources in some of our communities. Down the road, we have in some of our more remote and rural areas, we have non-Aboriginal and Aboriginal communities that both are lacking health support and health services. So partnership with those non-Aboriginal communities is really important to bring health services to places where they're not available right now. For me, it's about First Nations citizens understanding their responsibility as an individual. It's about 
First Nations and Aboriginal families under, understanding their responsibilities as a family. Our communities understanding their responsibilities as a community and our nations taking their responsibility for their decisions as a nation. It's less about what Canada has to say, less about what the province has to say. It's more about what we have to say and what we're going to do about resolving our issues and taking advantage of the opportunities. The people need to have an understanding, a clear understanding about what will happen, how the authority will look, what the structure will be like, and and what the expectation is. When you think about the model, the leadership that we have to implement this model comes from the First Nations Health Council. At a provincial level, we have three members from each of the five geographic regions in BC sitting together as a 15-member health council. They provide strategic level political direction and leadership to the implementation of the plan, including the negotiation of the framework agreement, and are now responsible for its implementation. The First Nations Health Directors Association was formed to provide technical advice to the First Nations Health Council and the First Nations Health Authority on the work that we do around programs and services from their expertise in terms of being a collective of health directors who work on the ground running programs and services in First Nations communities. The First Nations Health Authority will be the operational arm of all of this that will hold all the resources from the federal government and administer through contracts and contribution agreements to First Nations communities the resources required to run programs and services on the ground in communities that are prepared and have the capacity to do that. In other situations, the First Nations Health Authority will be a service provider for certain services in small communities that need that kind of support and help. The creation of regional offices is very important to, to ensure that this process is successful, otherwise we'll be creating a central agency that has not worked for First Nations in British Columbia. Once you're centralized away from the community-based programs, you lose touch. So it's really important that we have offices in every part of British Columbia so, so that it becomes a focal point of collecting information, it becomes a focal point of um, research and development, it becomes a focal point of gathering data so that we could develop a, a comprehensive provincial agenda for First Nations health. In the next two years, the First Nations Health Council will be working with Health Canada, where we will complete the transfer of the Pacific region from government control to First Nations control. The implementation of the framework agreement required the creation of an, an implementation committee. So we are currently doing that with our federal and provincial partners. The implementation committee will last for five years and it will oversee four streams of work that are identified in the framework agreement in terms of commitments. One is around the conclusion of sub-agreements. The second is around the notion of transition or transfer. The third is around interim management of the FINI operations today. And the fourth is around the provincial partnerships that we envision in the framework agreement that need to be developed and established. So the implementation committee is creating its own process. It's required to put in place an implementation plan, which will set out how these four streams of work will be carried out. Committees and groups, working groups, will be established in each of these four areas to ensure that the work is carried out accordingly in relation to the work moving forward. We have devised an engagement pathway to ensure that people see how their input is being used, when it'll be received, what we're doing with that input, how we will shape it and give it back to them so they can see how it is being used, coming back to them for the final decision on what we have shaped with their, their thinking. Because we do have the regions to work with, and as I mentioned, we have so many First Nations that we've got to be able to receive information from all of them. But we cannot react as individuals against individual desires. We have to try to best boil down all of that good thinking and all of those directions into some common platform or common picture, which is sometimes difficult. But I'll tell you, it's getting easier as people's people's vision forms around what we're trying to achieve here. I think this would be a success because First Nations leadership in this province have accepted the responsibility to take care of their people. The creation of a First Nations Health Authority will be successful because it's driven by First Nations, it's controlled by First Nations, and we are the ones that can best 
deliver health programs and services and close the health gaps that exist in First Nations communities. It's critical for First Nations in BC to remain focused and not get distracted by news of budget cuts, that we remain true to the path that we've set for ourselves. And each First Nation, now we have to actually envision and say, what is a strong, vibrant, healthy, self-sustaining First Nation? They have to answer that question for themselves because I can't answer it. I can't say enough about how all our people should be excited about this opportunity, where they can stand up and say, that's my health system and our people created that. We are the ones that we have been waiting for, and I absolutely believe that. This time, this place, this generation, we are the ones that are going to do this. We are going to create the transformation we need from a sickness system to a wellness system. Every parent wants the lives of their children to be better than what they had. Every grandparent wants the lives of their grandchildren to be better than what their children had. And so together, BC First Nations leaders, health directors and citizens can work together to create a better place for their children and their grandchildren. That's why this will succeed. What it means in a housing is that this wellness plan, health plan, is going to be yours. This is your health authority. This is your health authority. This is your First Nations health authority. This is our health authority. We need your help to get it right. We have the foundation. Now is time to change the structure for the better.